Okay, we can gather again. We we'll talk about a very important topic. I did think of something. <laughs> Funny how thoughts just come to you uh, in response to Annie's question last night um, about like how much academics to be doing and what to be doing, um, I would encourage you to study out the concept of the, con- and you may have already, the common branches in the spirit of prophecy. Uh, that is definitely something that we need to do regardless. And she talks about keeping accounts. Do we know how to do our finances, pay our taxes, all that kind of good stuff? Um, she talks about, I'm trying to remember the list. It's been a while since I've looked at it. But another big one that we often neglect is understanding how to uh, write and convey our thoughts correctly and be able to speak to other people correctly. The culture of the voice is one of the common branches, and that's not just singing, that's being able to speak well and uh, persuade others for our faith. Uh, being able to write correctly and things like that. So that's something often neglected. We do a little bit of grammar maybe in some writings, but really being under, able to understand how to convey our thoughts and how to uh, win others for the truth. That's what it really is for. Um, so uh, I would just encourage, it was just another thought I had in regard to your question last night. Study out the common branches. It's an important one, yeah. That's fine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hands down. Um, it's, yeah, that, that, that's rarely a problem. And, and again, it comes back to what we talked about last night and um, drawing a blank on your name. Jacob, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Jacob actually, you know, brought out the question. Okay, if, if, I, didn't, if I decide not to study algebra because I don't feel like I need it, but then uh, I have children and maybe my children want to study algebra, how am I going to teach them? And that is a false educational philosophy. <laughs> True education is about teaching them how to be self-motivated and learn for themselves and be self-directed. You're going to learn that through, uh, through primarily through work and responsibility and things like that in everyday life. But you teach this self-directed, self-motivated mindset so that later on, when they come to something they need to learn, they just apply themselves and learn it. So when they come to the college situation, they apply themselves and learn it. And I've seen it in you know, numerous situations. So it's not about how much information you've inculcated. It's about your ability to learn and teaching a child those things. Yeah, Judy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's quite lengthy. It is, what yeah. I, what I have done with it is um, separate it to academic or non academic. Uh huh. And so I have that list for anybody that wants to. Excellent. Yeah. Contact Judy for that list of subjects to be taught. There's also a little pamphlet. I think it's pamphlet number 124, if I remember right. It's called What Shall We Teach? It's just a, a collection of things that we need to make sure that we're teaching our children. So definitely encourage you to look that up. Okay, we have a short period of time to cover a very important and very big topic <laughs> on the topic of competition. I've called it, What Shall We Play? Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, as we continue to study your counsel, I know that this is a topic that Satan has really woven into our lives. And Lord, please, Help us to be willing to receive your truth. Help us to listen to the prompting of your spirit. Open our hearts and minds to understand. Please speak to us, and Lord, please speak through me. Give me your words, and I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Different cultures depend on competition to different degrees in structuring their economic system or schooling or recreation. At one end of the spectrum are societies that function without any competition at all. At the other end is the United States. (laughs) 
From, <laughs> here's some illustrations from the Little League ball player who burst into tears after his team loses to the college students in the football stadium chanting, we are number one. From Lyndon Johnson, whose judgment was almost certainly distorted by his often stated desire not to be the first American president to lose a war, to the third grader who despises his classmate for a superior performance on an arithmetic test, we manifest a staggering cultural obsession with victory. Our schooling from the earliest grades trains us not only to triumph over others, but to regard them as, as obstacles to our own success. Our leisure time is filled with highly structured games in which one individual or team must defeat another. So true, right? Our society, our economy, our workforce, our schooling, our entertainment, and the list goes on, is based in this principle of competition. It is our world. And that is probably the one, number one argument you're going to hear on this topic. Well, it's just part of our world. Absolutely it is. No argument there. But Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, I want to refresh our memories with something we looked at yesterday afternoon. Unselfishness. The principle of God's kingdom is the principle that Satan hates. Its very existence he denies. From the beginning of the great controversy, he has endeavored to prove God's principles of action to be selfish, and he deals in the same way with all who serve God. To disprove Satan's claim is the work of Christ and all who bear his name. This is the principle that started the great controversy. Selfishness versus unselfishness. You have one kingdom based on selfishness, the other kingdom based on unselfishness, and it's up to us to know which kingdom are we being prepared to be part of. Now, we looked at the story of Job yesterday. I'm going to uh, breeze through that. Let's talk about the first element of competition in our society, and that is competitive education. At such a time as this, Education 225 tells us, what is the trend of the education given? To what motive is appeal most often made? To self-seeking. That's the principle of Satan's kingdom. So according to the spirit of prophecy, the trend and motivation of most educational institutions and methodologies is to develop selfishness, which is preparing us to function in which kingdom? Satan's kingdom. The message that competition is appropriate, desirable, required, and even unavoidable is drummed into us from nursery school to graduate school. It is the subtext of every lesson. Interesting. We think we're studying math, but Satan is woven into this environment, drilling into us this principle of competition. For two centuries, our educational system has been based upon competitiveness. If you're a student who knows the correct answer and the teacher calls on one of the other kids, it's likely you will sit there hoping and praying the kid will come up with the wrong answer, so you'll have a chance to show the teacher how smart you are. Indeed, children's peers are their enemies to be beaten. In a hyper-competitive society, it's never too early to begin such training. Readiness programs have appeared to prepare infants for the feverish competition at the better nursery schools. <laughs> By, by the time of elementary school, the pressure to be number one is nothing new, but it has just begun to be codified and quantified. A third grader may be crushed, for instance, if her homework assignment is stamped with a smiley face, while others receive a smiley face and a very good. Eventually, this ranking takes the form of grades. The social context, which the spirit of prophecy speaks against grades, right? The social context of most educational measurement is that of a contest in which students are measured primarily in comparison with one another, rather in terms of objective criteria of accomplishment. Where in this carefully designed laboratory of competition can a child even sample cooperative achievement? In fact, most teachers misunderstand the very word cooperation. They use it to refer to obedience. <laughs> Isn't that true? To cooperate, it means to follow instructions. We have another word for genuine cooperative effort, as several writers have pointed out. It's cheating. <laughs> when class is over, the lesson continues. Children are taught that all games must have a winner and a loser. As Peter and Bridget Berger have written, it is only very young children who sometimes wish wistfully that everyone should win. And they soon learn that this is impossible. In American society, that is, for there are other societies in which children actually play games in which everyone wins. The idea that everyone can win evokes condescending smiles, and it doesn't take long before these children come to accept the naturalness of competition. I, I know it's a lot we're reading, but are, are you seeing the process you know, of this conditioning that's going on? Dan Greenberg, who founded the Sudbury Valley School, said the primary, almost exclusive mode of relationship fostered by schools among children in the same class is competition. 
cutthroat competition. The pecking order is the all in all. Who is better than whom? Who's smarter, faster, taller, handsomer, and of course, who is worse, stupider, slower, shorter, or uglier? Anyone who's been in the conventional classroom knows this is absolutely true. John Taylor Gatto, New York, New York State Teacher of the Year and author of the uh, pretty amazing little book called Dumbing Us Down. The children I teach are cruel to each other. They lack compassion for misfortune. They laugh at weakness, for they have contempt for people whose need for help shows too plainly. Now think about this. What do they do? Lack compassion for misfortune, laugh at weakness, and show contempt for those whose need for help shows too plainly. Is that what Jesus did? When he saw our weakness, did he laugh at it? No, he came to help us. Now let's go to the little book, Studies in Christian Education. Some of you have picked up that one. Amazing little book by uh, E.A. Sutherland, comparing true versus false education, specifically the papal system of education. And here he describes the Jesuit educational philosophy. Nothing will be more honorable than to outstrip a fellow student and nothing more dishonorable than to be outstripped. Prizes will be distributed to the best pupils with the greatest solemnity. Have you been to a graduation ceremony recently? <laughs> But what, the, what does the council tell us? In God's plan, there's no place for selfish rivalry. Those who measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves are not wise. There it is right in the Bible, speaking against this competitive grades-based honor system that we have in conventional education. But how widely different is much of the education now given? From the child's earliest years, it is an appeal to emulation and rivalry. It fosters selfishness, the root of all evil. In our institutions of learning, there was to be exerted an influence that would counteract the influence of the world. So which way is the influence of the world going? Toward selfishness. We were supposed to go the other direction. And what should we do? Here's some practical, some practical instruction. And give no encouragement to indulgence in appetite, selfish gratification of the senses, pride, ambition, love of dress and display, love of praise and flattery, and notice this last one, strife for high rewards and honors as a recompense for good scholarship. All of this was to be discouraged in our schools. Wow. Horace Mann, one of the great influencers of the modern educational system, amazingly said, I hold and always have held it too unchristian to place two children in such relation to each other that if one wins, the other must lose. So place what scholars gain in intellect. In other words, yeah, okay, maybe we're motivating them to learn better or something because they want to beat someone else, but a thousand times more they lose in virtue. Wow. There's tremendous benefits, though, from cooperative learning. We have extensive research showing that competitive environments actually hinder a child's desire to learn, and cooperation encourages them to learn. We think, well, they have to have competition to motivate them. Absolutely not, according to the research. Cooperation encourages more, it more. And even beyond just the classroom environment, this applies to the structure of our institutions. Never are we to rely upon worldly recognition and rank. Never are we in the establishment of institutions to try to compete with worldly institutions in size or splendor. We shall gain the victory not by erecting massive buildings but in, in, or in rivalry with our enemies, but by cherishing a Christ-like spirit. At the very beginning of the gospel dispensation, he taught his church not to rely on uh, Sorry, to rely not on worldly rank and splendor, but on the power of faith and obedience. And here is the crux of the matter. Are we competing based on performance, or are we having faith and obedience in God's method? What gives us power? Obedience to God's word and faith that he will work it out. Not competing for that position. Of course, it's not just education. What about sports? Probably this is the most recognizable and significant form of competition in the world. There is no denying that this country's most popular recreational activities are structured so that one individual or team must triumph over another. Now, it's interesting, though. What is this actually teaching? What kind of character is this developing? Organized sport, from youth programs to the pros, has nothing at all to do with playfulness fun, joy, self-satisfaction, but is instead, notice this, a social agent for the deliberate socialization of people into the acceptance of the prevailing social structure and their fate as workers within bureaucratic organizations. 
Contrary to the myths propounded by promoters, sports are instruments not for human expression, but of social stasis. Remember what we talked about yesterday about the, the designers of the school system and what they engineered the system for? To, to do exactly this. Is it any wonder <laughs> that nearly every educational, out, edu educational institution out there has connected with it a sports program? I mean, that's just standard the way it operates, right? Both of them are geared toward creating the same thing. Sports does not simply build character. It builds exactly the kind of character that is most useful for the social system. From the perspective of our social and economic system, which is to say from the perspective of those who benefit from it and direct it, <laughs> it is useful to have people regard each other as rivals. Have we seen that growing in society? People regarding each other as rivals? Wow, polarization. Sports serve the purpose nicely, and athletes are quite deliberately led to accept the value and naturalness of an adversarial relationship in the place of solidarity and collective effort. If he's in a team sport, the athlete comes to see cooperation only as a means to victory, to see hostility and even aggression as legitimate, to accept conformity and authoritarianism. Participation in sports amounts to a kind of apprenticeship for life in contemporary America, or as David Reisman put it, the road to the boardroom leads through the locker room. It's said that sports prepare one for life. So the question really is, life where? Life on this earth or life in heaven? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it my kingdom were of this world, then when my servants fight or compete. But what has the Lord told us? Some of the most popular amusements, such as football and boxing, have become schools of brutality. They are developing the same characteristics as did the games of ancient Rome. The love of domination, the pride in mere brute force, the reckless disregard of life are exerting upon the youth a power to demoralize that is appalling. Most people agree with this, though. <laughs> What about the nicer, quote, nicer forms of sports? Okay, not, maybe not brutal football or boxing or something like that. What about the nicer forms of sports? In the night season, Ellen White writing, in the night season, I was witness to a performance that was carried on on the school grounds, one of our Adventist schools. A view of things was presented before me in which the students were playing games of tennis and cricket. We all agree those are pretty nice games, right? Nothing brutal like football and boxing. Then I was given instruction regarding the character of these amusements. They were presented to me as a species of idolatry, like the idols of the nations. Ooh. Over tennis and cricket. There were more than visible spectators on the ground. Satan and his angels were there, making impressions on human minds. Angels of God who minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation were also present, not to approve, but to disapprove. They were ashamed that such an exhibition should be given by the professed children of God. The forces of the enemy gained a decided victory, and God was dishonored. He who gave his life to refine and noble and sanctify human beings was grieved at the performance. Those are strong words. Hearing a voice, I turned to see who spoke with me. Then with dignity and solemnity, one, that's capitalized, who is this speaking of? This is Jesus. Said, is this the celebration for the anniversary of the opening of the school? Is this the gratitude offering you would present to God for the blessing he has given you? The world could render an ex as acceptable an offering on this memorial occasion. The teachers are making the same mistake that has been made over and over again. They should learn wisdom from the experiences of the past. The careless, godless world can offer an abundance of such offerings of these in a much more acceptable manner. Turning to the teachers, he, Jesus, said, you have made a mistake, the effects of which will be hard to efface. The Lord God of Israel is not glorified in the school. If at this time the Lord should permit your life to end, many would be lost, eternally separated from God and the righteous. These are not my words, <laughs> but it is solemn. All over these games of tennis and cricket, The real issue, though, here is that sports don't prepare us for heaven. 
what would sports look like in heaven? You know, Ellen White actually spoke about this. What would sports look like in heaven? This is what we are in the world for, on trial to see if we will be fit for the courts above, to see if God can honor us or become one of, uh, to become one of the heavenly family in the kingdom of glory. If we are so selfish here, how will we manifest anything like unselfishness in the kingdom of glory? How will we do it? We would be wanting to snatch the crown from another's head because it is more brilliant than ours. <laughs> Another would become jealous and we should have as bad a time as when Satan set up that work in heaven of rebellion against God. It's not preparing us for heaven. Now let's talk about some myths about competition though. You've probably heard some of these arguments. Uh, some people say, well, competition is inevitable. It's just human nature. It's just the way we are. Well, we could go into the studies that say that actually we are naturally more inclined to cooperate and work together with others, but just supposing that that is the way we are, seeing as our carnal nature is sinful and selfish, what does God say he wants to do about the way we are? He wants to change us. So saying this is the way we are is just acknowledging that we need to be changed from it. <laughs> we need to not stay that way. Now, other people say, well, the natural world is competitive. Just look out in nature. Look at all the competition that goes on. Yes, according to Darwin, according to the effects of sin, but in God's beautiful plan, untainted by sin, there's tremendous cooperation and symbiosis. Others may say that com co sorry, competition is necessary for success and improves productivity. They say things like, even minimal productivity to say nothing of excellence would disappear if we cease competing. Competition brings out the best in us. To compete is to strive for goals, to learn competence, to reach for success. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's what people say. He's just you know, quoting the, the ideas out there. The American mind in particular has been trained to equate success with victory, to equate doing well with beating someone. That's how we've been trained. We think that competition is essential or even beneficial, but is the premise even true? Let's think about it. Success and competition are not all the same thing. <laughs> Put plainly, one can set and reach goals or prove that one's own and other's satisfaction, prove to one's own and other's satisfaction that one is competent without ever competing. I can succeed in knitting a scarf or writing a book without ever trying to make it better than yours. Better yet, I can work with you, say, to prepare a dinner or build a house. Many people take the absence of competition to mean that one must be wandering aimlessly without any goals. But competing simply means that one is working toward a goal in such a way as to prevent others from reaching their goals. This is one approach to getting something done, but happily not the only one. Competition need never enter the picture in order for skills to be mastered and displayed, goals set and met." like the seven-year-old who was asked how fast he had run in the race, and he said, just as fast as I could. That was all that mattered. Amen. Now they've done studies. They find the results of the meta-analysis. That's a combination of many studies. Indicate that cooperation is considerably more effective than interpersonal competition and individualistic efforts. Now, if I told you that a study found that uh, cooperation was more effective at promoting uh, success than competition, you'd think, well, okay, one study showed that, that's great. If I told you I found three studies that showed that, you'd be like, well, you know, maybe, <laughs> probably correct. If I told you, you know, I found 10 studies that have shown that cooperation promotes higher levels of success than competition, you'd be like, okay, matter solved. 10 studies, that's pretty, that's pretty good research. 65 studies found that cooperation promotes higher achievement than competition. It's a pretty settled fact in the science. There was absolutely no evidence to suggest that people work more productively when rewards are tied to performance than when everyone gets the same reward. But for those tasks where success depends on working together, there was a clear difference. Cooperation. Interesting, John Holt wrote that we destroy the love of learning in children. We think it helps them learn better. 
It actually destroys it, which is so strong when they are small, by encouraging and compelling them to work for petty and contemptible rewards, gold stars, papers marked 100 and tacked to the wall, A's on report cards, honor rolls, dean's list, 5 eta kappa keys, in short, for the ignoble satisfaction of feeling that they are better than someone else. We damage the love, we destroy, it says, the love of learning. Cooperativeness is positively related to numerous indexes of psychological health, such as emotional maturity, well-adjusted social relations, strong personal identity, and basic trust in and optimism about other people. So, <laughs> need we further evidence? <laughs> the spirit of prophecy is clear. The science is absolutely clear. The competition is not part of God's kingdom, and it is actually not helpful for success. Let's go deeper, though. Let's turn our question, uh, turn our attention to the question of amusement. This takes it deeper than just, is it a competitive game? Is it a competitive sport? It is Satan's policy, we read, to fill the mind with a desire for worldly amusement that there may be no time for the question, how is it with my soul? What does Satan want to do? He doesn't really actually care. Of course, it'd be great, of, according to his philosophy, it's great if it's a competitive sport. But if he can get you to, I mean, if you, know, you decide you don't want competitive sports, if, he'll be just as happy to just get you past your time in amusement so that you're not considering how is it with my soul, competitive or not. Satan is delighted when he sees human beings using their physical and mental powers in that which does not educate, which is not useful, which does not help them to be a blessing to those who need their help. How should we measure our activities? They should be educational, they should be useful, and they should be a blessing to others. While the youth are becoming expert in games that are of no real value to themselves or to others, Satan is playing the game of life for their souls, taking from them the talents that God has given them and placing in their stead his own evil attributes. In his effort to lead men to ignore God, he seeks to engross and absorb the mind so completely that God will find no place in their thoughts. He does not wish people to have a knowledge of their maker, and he is well pleased if he can set in operation games and theatrical performances theatrical performances that will so confuse the senses of the youth that God in heaven will be forgotten. I'd like to share a story from Avondale School that shed some light on this issue. When I first read it, I was, well, it's solemn. On an opening day celebration, Avondale School, the year 1900, E.R. Palmer and C.B. Hughes, principal and business manager, respectively, planned for the day that which they thought to be appropriate, a morning service at which Ellen White was invited to address students and faculty, and in the afternoon, various recreational games. Does this sound a little familiar to activities we might plan, you know? A little spiritual program and then the games and activities. What kind of activities? Cricket for the girls, uh, sorry, cricket for the boys, tennis for the girls, and then some other games. Faculty members and students joined in raising money with which to purchase the equipment. Other games, as remembered by Ella White Robinson, included three-legged races, eating apples suspended from a string with the player's arms tied behind them, carrying eggs in a teaspoon in a knee race, etc. The students enjoyed the day very much and at the close of it felt very grateful toward me, especially for planning such a pleasant time. Totally innocent, right? I mean, this is just fun stuff. Not even necessarily competitive in nature, all of it. After giving her morning address, Ellen White returned to her sunny side home and to her work. But during the following night, as she was to write later, I seemed to be witnessing the performances of the afternoon. The scene was clearly laid out before me, and I was given a message for the manager and the teachers of the school. I was shown that in the amusements carried on on the school grounds that afternoon, the enemy gained a victory, and the teachers were weighed in the balances and found wanting. The Avondale School was established not to be like the schools of the world, but as the Lord revealed, to be a pattern school. And since it was to be a pattern school, those in charge of it should have perfected everything after God's plan, discarding all that was not in harmony with his will. Had their eyes been anointed with a heavenly eye salve, they would have realized that they could not permit the exhibition that took place that afternoon without dishonoring God. 
When Professor Hughes inquired of Ellen White why, in the light of her counsel, that teachers should play with their students, he should be reproved for what he had done, they had done, the answer came that the students at Avondale were not children, but young men and young women preparing to be laborers for God. Now, this is interesting. We're going to talk more about that in just a minute. But God makes a difference in age, doesn't he? <laughs> he calls the youth to a higher level of accountability and usefulness than he does the children. And um, again, we'll differentiate that with that a little bit later. Then, with his concordance, he searched his Bible. One of the first references he turned to related to the children of Israel when they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor were other texts any more helpful. <laughs> when he came to recognize that winning in games meant others must fail, he was led to conclude that the spirit of most games and sports was not the right spirit of the adult Christian. Amusements are doing more to counteract the working of the Holy Spirit than anything else anything else and the lord is grieved what was that mild. mild yeah i cannot find an instance in the life of christ where he devoted time to play and amusement i've not been able to find one instance where he taught the disciples to engage in amusement in order to gain physical exercise question though did jesus teach his disciples to engage in recreation Absolutely he did. So is there a difference between recreation and amusement? Absolutely there is. So what are the, what are the alternatives? <clears throat> Here's the first alternative. The greatest benefit is not gained from exercise that's taken as play or exercise merely. There is some benefit in being in the fresh air and also from the exercise of the muscles, but let the same amount of energy be given to the performance of useful work and the benefit will be greater. So what's the first alternative to amusements and competition? Useful. Useful work. In the place of providing diversions that merely amuse, arrangements should be made for exercises that will be productive of good. Satan would lead the students who are sent to our schools to receive an education that will enable them to go forth as workers in God's cause to believe that amusements are necessary to physical health. But the Lord has declared that the better way, anyone familiar with the statement that says it is the watchword of true education is something better, all right? We're replacing, we're not just getting rid of something, replacing it with something better. The better way is for them to get physical exercise through manual training and letting useful employment take the place of selfish pleasure. The desire for amusement, if indulged, soon develops a dislike. Has anyone seen that? for useful health for exercise of body and mind, such as will make students efficient in helping others and themselves. Sorry, helping themselves and others. Now, I'm going to go back to that story from Avondale. The teachers asked Sister White another question. They said they were perplexed to know what to do with the students Sunday afternoons. They thought they could unite with them in these games and they would not be strolling around in the bush. I said, is there not an abundance of work to be done on this farm? where all the energy, energy intact would be turned to the most useful account in a good work. Did we catch that? The teachers are like, well, what are we supposed to do during this free time? She said, well, isn't there work to be done on the farm? <laughs> Replacing it with useful work. Okay, but there's another thing that we can do. All are to be rightly educated as in the schools of the prophets. Let another teacher educate how to do work in helping some of the worthy poor about us. Here's another alternative to competitive sports and amusements. There are houses that can be built. Get your students under a man who's a builder and see if you cannot find something that can be done in the lines of education and in the lines of holiness. Building a house is holiness. <laughs> it's in the lines of holiness, according to this, right? When it's, you know, it's being done for a good purpose, you're helping someone else. What was the result? Now, this is interesting. One of the students and another young man banded together in the light of Ellen White's counsel to study what they could accomplish in helping others in the community. Now, this is interesting. The students took this on. Okay, we've been counseled not to do these amusements. Let's find what we can do instead. They found many places where they could help those in need. And this positive type of recreation provided soul-warming experiences in Christian service. In just a short time, they sensed the advantages of finding recreation in activities that bring strength to the character as well as to the body. The grueling experience bore a good harvest. How beautiful. So we have useful work, manual training, helping others. These are alternatives. 
Now, for those who say that sports are necessary to learn teamwork, here we have some teamwork going on, right? Orange shirts against striped shirts, working together. Let me give another picture, though, illustrating some teamwork. <laughs> Which one is some better teamwork? <laughs> the useful work, obviously, right? And look how, just how happy they are. Can you see that guy over there with that smile on his face looking at me? He's just as happy as ever. Uh, this is at a school that I worked with in Tanzania, and uh, the, the children loved it. You know, I found it interesting as we developed the agriculture program, uh, we never had any issues with the students. It was the teachers that had problems with the new programs we were developing. The teachers, uh, the students love to engage in that. God ordained, this is important, God ordained that the beings he created should work. Upon this, their muscles depend? Happiness depends. Do we want to be happy? <laughs> we need to work. Healthy young men and women have no need of cricket, ball playing, or any kind of amusement just for the gratification of self to pass away the time. There are useful things to be done by every one of God's created intelligences. Someone needs from you something that will help him. Our happiness increases and our powers develop as we engage in useful employment. Now, we find in the council here this idea of useful work and helping others very intertwined. You know, useful work can become com competitive too, right? <laughs> it can be self-centered. I'm going to get all this work done so I can make a lot of money and all those sorts of things. No, useful work should really be in the context of helping others as much as possible. Of course, that can be in the family also, helping others in the family, helping mom and dad, uh, during childhood especially. But what about recreation? Is there a place for recreation? Does God want to just, you know, work all the time, never take a break? Absolutely, we can take a break. Jesus told his disciples, come apart and rest a while. There is definitely a place for recreation. And God also differentiates between, differentiates between ages. God, youth cannot be made as sedate and grave as old age. <laughs> the child is sober as the sire. <laughs> While sinful amusements are condemned, as they should be, let parents, teachers, and guardians of youth provide in their stead innocent pleasures which will not taint or corrupt the morals. Playing together outside, running, jumping, getting the activity, throwing a ball back and forth in a game of catch, things like that, nothing wrong with those activities. Again, there's a differentiation between youth and childhood. You don't want to get to, as it says, sinful amusements or competitive sports you will avoid at any age. But for children, absolutely play together as a family. It is the privilege and duty, duty. Some of us workaholic adults need to hear this one. Duty of Christians to seek to refresh their spirits and invigorate their bodies by innocent recreation with the purpose of using their physical and mental powers to the glory of God. While we restrain our children from worldly pleasures that have a tendency to corrupt and mislead, we ought to provide them innocent recreation to lead them in pleasant paths where there is no danger. No child of God need to have a sad or mournful experience. Divine commands, divine promises show that this is so. Wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. Okay, how do we differentiate between recreation and amusement? The book Education actually has an entire chapter on recreation. I encourage you to read that. And it opens up by saying, there is a distinction between recreation and amusement. Great, so now it's gonna tell us what it is. Recreation, when true to its name, recreation, tends to strengthen and build up. Calling us aside from our ordinary cares and occupation, it affords refreshment for mind and body and thus enables us to return with new vigor to the earnest work of life. Amusement, on the other hand, is sought for the sake of pleasure and is often carried to excess. It absorbs the energies that are required for useful work and thus proves a hindrance to life's true success. Very clear distinction there. And of course, you know, as was mentioned earlier, if children are just immersed in amusement and entertainment all the time, they lose their taste for useful work. Then we can identify that is not true innocent recreation. Recreation should invigorate one to then return to work with, with joy and renewed energy. And I just want to make sure we're defining this well. Would this fall into the category of recreation? <laughs> this is amusement. <laughs> Certainly it's a useful tool we need to use uh, as part of our lives, but 
uh, it should not have a place as recreation or entertainment. What type of recreation? Do we have some examples of recreation? Absolutely. Recreation in the open air, the contemplation of the works of God in nature will be of the highest benefit. So where's the first place to get recreation? Inside or out? <laughs> Outside. She gives an example, actually, in the Adventist home of something families can do. Let several families living in a city or village unite and leave the occupations which have taxed them physically and mentally and make an excursion into the country. Sounds like a camping trip, right? <laughs> to the side of a fine lake or to a nice grove where the scenery of nature is beautiful. They should provide themselves with plain hygienic food, the very best fruits and grains, and spread their table under the shade of some tree or under the canopy of heaven. The ride, the exercise, and the scenery will quicken the appetite, and they can enjoy a repast which kings might envy. <laughs> Anyone experience this? What a pleasure it is, right? This is true recreation. On such occasions, parents should bring their cell phones with them and absorb themselves in their emails. <laughs> no. Parents and children should feel free from care, labor, and perplexity. Parents should become children with their children making everything as pleasant for them as possible. Let the whole day be given to recreation. Exercise in the open air for those whose employment has been with indoors and sedentary will be beneficial to health. All who can should feel it a duty to pursue this course. Nothing will be lost but much gained. They can return to their occupations with new life and new courage to engage in their labor with zeal, and they are better prepared to resist disease. Wow. So many benefits. Now, what about gatherings for, uh, what about social gatherings within the church? How do we make sure we don't engage in amusement uh, for that? Here we have some counsel here. Gatherings for social intercourse are made in the highest degree profitable and instruction when those who meet together have the love of God glowing in their hearts, when they meet to exchange thoughts in regard to the word of God, or to consider methods for advancing his work you can have planning sessions forever on that, right? There's a lot there to engage the energies of youth and in doing good to their fellow men. When the Holy Spirit is regarded as a welcome guest at these gatherings, when nothing is said or done to grieve him away, God is honored and those who meet together are refreshed and strengthened. So here's how we can conduct our social gatherings. And I've seen this done. Um, you know, I've seen when families come together and they want to exchange thoughts on the word of God. They want to make plans for how we can help others get the young people involved in these discussions and help them make it their own and they will enjoy it. There's no need for amusements. In the lines of recreation for the student, the best results will be attained through the personal cooperation of the teacher. Here's an important principle. Are we sending our children out? Go, go have some recreation. No personal cooperation of the teacher or the parent, of course. The true teacher can impart to his people so er, few gifts so valuable as the gift of his own companionship. It is true of men and women, and how much more of youth and children, that as we come in touch through sympathy, can we understand them. Only as we come in touch through sympathy can we understand them, and we need to understand in order to most effectively benefit. To strengthen the tie of sympathy between teacher and student, there are a there are few means that count so much as pleasant association together outside the schoolroom. In some schools, the teacher is always with his pupils in their hours of recreation. He unites in their pursuits, accompanies them in their excursions, and seems to make himself one with them. Well would it be for our schools were this practice more generally followed. The sacrifice demanded of the teacher would be great, but he would reap a rich reward. And I've seen this. Uh, there was a school that I worked with that um, we established a program of class teachers. So one teacher was primarily um, handling the one grade and um, teaching all the subjects versus this rotation where you have the expert coming in for the different subjects. I said, no, these are, these are young children. You can handle these subjects. <laughs> Let's have a class teacher and invest in relationship with them. Our third grade teacher was, he loved the relationship with his students and he was with them all the time. Break times, teacher and students went outside together and played together. Class times, they're back in together. Work times, they were working together. Garden time, they're out in the garden together. He really invested himself in the relationship. Third grade. Fourth grade teacher um, <laughs> didn't. <laughs> he, he would deliver the lecture, 
give the exercises, and that was just about all the interaction that those students had with him. At the end of the year, when the test results came in, this, again, this was not a perfect educa true education environment. We were making improvements. <laughs> the test results came in. The third grade children were more advanced academically than the fourth grade children on the same subjects because of the benefit of the relationship. <clears throat> and here's another form of recreation. No recreation helpful only to themselves will prove so great a blessing to the children and youth as that which makes them helpful to others. The watchful teacher will find many opportunities for directing pupils to acts of helpfulness. By little children especially, the teacher is regarded with almost unbounded confidence and respect. Whatever he may suggest as to ways of helping in the home, faithfulness in the daily tasks, ministry to the sick or the poor can hardly fail of bringing forth fruit. Aren't we so blessed, friends? This is so practical. It's so clear. And it boils right back down to that principle of the government of God, unselfishness. Which kingdom are we being prepared for? There's some amazing statements about unselfishness. We read a great work will be accomplished by the people of God if they will work in unity and unselfishness. Now, if we will all go to work unselfishly with an eye single to the glory of God, humbling their hearts and repenting of their sins, God will work in their behalf. Souls will be converted. Unselfishness, not competition. And we're told to dwell much more on the unselfishness of Christ. Perhaps as we've talked about this, you're like, man, I don't know how to do this. And this is, I'm not naturally unselfish. Anyone here want to say, oh, I'm just naturally an unselfish kind of person? <laughs> it's not in our hearts. <laughs> We're naturally selfish. So what do we do with those selfish traits of character that seek to rise up? Dwell much more on the unselfishness of Christ. If you're unhappy that maybe you have to leave a nice home to work for the Lord, dwell on the fact that Jesus left heaven for you. If you feel like your life is sad, dwell on the fact that Jesus left a place of light and happiness and came to darkness and sadness. If others are criticizing your unselfish actions, dwell on the fact that Jesus left love and came to hatred. If you feel misunderstood, dwell on the fact that Jesus was misunderstood his entire life. If you feel like your service is unappreciated, dwell on the fact that Jesus left a place where everybody appreciated him and came to a place where they disobeyed him and crucified him. If you feel like nobody likes you, dwell on the fact that Jesus left the adoration of angels to come and be spat upon. Dwell more, dwell much more on the unselfishness of Christ. Only by a transformation of character can we fully obey this counsel. This is not something, I want to be clear, this is not something that we can say, oh, okay, that activity is competitive, that one's not, that one's amusement, that one's recreation. That's not going to work that way. We have to be converted in our hearts. We have to have the principle of unselfishness placed in our hearts. And when we are converted, when we have that change of heart, these questions will be pretty obvious to us as to how we should be spending our time. Amen. Let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, how grateful we are for your counsel, but as we see it, we recognize that we cannot obey it in our own strength. We recognize that we need a change of heart. We see that we are sinful, selfish human beings, bent in that direction, and we are being conditioned, not for heaven, but for this life on this earth only. And Lord, we, we want to be prepared for heaven. So Father, I pray you'll change our hearts. Help us to dwell more on the unselfishness of Jesus and seek to be like him daily. Help us in all our decisions, Lord, to please you. I pray again for each family here that you give them wisdom in following your plan. 
Help them to take that next step in the light that you've given. And may you continue to shed light on the pathway. Thank you for your promises. Thank you that you're so willing to help us. You're more willing to help us than we can even comprehend. And we're grateful. Go with us now. I pray that we'll store these things in our hearts and that we will apply them to our lives. Help us, we pray. We thank you. We ask for safety as we go back to our homes and travel. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. It has been a true pleasure to be here. I wish I could stay and socialize and we could have a meal together, but I have a flight to catch. (laughs) And so um, God bless to each one of you. And uh, feel free to contact me through my website to get materials. Um, If you want a consultation, have questions, I'm happy to answer questions. And of course, uh, donations to support the ministry are always a blessing also. Thank you all.